This morning is the strong Christian body. The strong Christian body, if you could open your Bibles up. It's not a long lesson. I'm trying to follow the section of text, and sometimes you got to break the chapters off because Paul might change stride right in the middle of a chapter, and then it would make it a long, long sermon. It'd make it like two sermons into one. So this one here will be a little bit shorter lesson. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and 13. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The Corinthian Christians, as we learned from the beginning and in several lessons, were very, very divisive. Um, and Paul aimed to deal with this in a way they could relate to. When becoming a Christian, we tend to hang on to our independent nature. That's just human. That's just being a human. We do things our way and all of a sudden, you know, we go from that to start singing, have thy own way, Lord. Well, then there's a battle that starts. We start focusing on individual identity instead of the group. This is not the attitude Christians were told to have. Uh, we are to live a life which reflects well on the church. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. We're to pray for our needs through the church. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, 11 through 13. We are to share our struggles and victories together as a church, James 5, 13 and 14. We're to seek out the needs of others in the church, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. So in communicating this principle... Of you, you have to see there are individuals that make up a body. Paul says, just like we have bodies that have a lot of individual parts, 13 individualized systems, and within that, you're, you know the average human being is 100 trillion cells? 100 trillion of them. And your DNA is unique. God wrote your DNA. Not Bill Gates, not somebody else. God did. He owns the patent on that. And they only know 9 billion of the three-digit double phosphate codes between the double helix. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, as the scripture says. And so just as a human body is made up of hundreds of body parts, they still refer to it as one body. The same is true for the body of Christ. And at what point did they cease being the rugged individual? It was when we were baptized into Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2, I want, don't, don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers all passed through under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all drank of the same spiritual rock and that rock was Christ. Okay? That's what Paul said. So he already laid that as the foundation. So by the time he gets up to here, he is now transitioning that in the same way that the Jews were baptized as a nation. We thought it was just a neat aquarium trick when they crossed the Red Sea, but it was much more than that. God had to pass them through water. It had to be a foreshadowing of the covenant. So as they passed through water on each side and had a vaporous cloud, which is made of what? Water. They were immersed. They passed through the watery tunnel and came up on the other side in covenant with God at that point. The law. That's when they were received the law in less than 50 days. 
And so, and then what they do? They were complaining about drinking. Well, I don't have anything to drink. Uh, Exodus chapter 17. And Moses struck the rock, rock at Horeb, and they drank from a rock. And Paul said that spiritual rock, see, he's making the final transition. He's borrowing from this. And this is, uh, 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 if they understood the previous point, which we just made, we put it in the context of this point. Paul's saying specifically for Christians, borrowing from that language back here, he pulls it up, for by one spirit we were all baptized in one body. I says we were all made to drink from one spirit. He's just finishing the thought out. Now the transition is complete. It isn't what the denominational world is saying when they make up the existential doctrine of, of, of baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they relate it to what John said, because that's a totally different thing, as we already covered. And so, if they got the first point, they'll get this. You know, in John 7, 37 to 39, Jesus eluded long before early in the ministry. He says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me and the scripture said, from the innermost being shall flow the rivers of the living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, for whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so you remember that woman at the well in John chapter 4? He said, if you would have known who's talking to you, you would have fetched me some water and I'd give you some living water. And this is that living water that he was talking about, not some hidden stream where you can go to and get the cool, fresh water. You see, this is what it's talking about. That the Holy Spirit that becomes the earnest of our redemption at the point we enter covenant with God. That's what Ephesians 1 says, the earnest of our redemption. He is the down payment for a future possession of eternal life. That is what happens. So Paul coalesced that there, and then he transitions to this, back to the body. For the body is not one member but many. Okay. And if the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. For if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. Let's process that. To best understand the text here, it's important to know something about the ancient sanctuaries of healing that took place. The medical world for the pagan back then, they'd often make, and I got a picture here for you, I took this at Corinth. This is actually things they've unearthed in Corinth. They had temples to Asclepion and various healing gods. And for medical purposes, they would design individual parts of the body, and then they would go ahead and they'd cast spells and do something magical as a medical treatment. And they'd put it on here. So all you had to do was just hold that. They'd make you some. As long as you carried it, your arm would get better. So they looked at it independently of the whole body. Let me read to you, quote, one of the most famous sanctuaries of the god Asclepion was Epidauros in Ar Argolid, some 40 kilometers southeast of Corinth. Corinth itself had a sanctuary of Asclepius called Asclepion. It is perhaps no coincident, uh, could, uh, coincidence that Paul links body parts to gifts of healing at this point. 
That was Clinton Arnold in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. And so Paul's saying, when he goes back to here, he says the body is a one member. You know, don't take the MD approach when you look at the church and you look at who you are in the church, take the osteopathic approach. That way you see the big picture. There have been many hundreds of these medical uh, models recovered uh, throughout this region. I mean, that was, I mean, I saw walls and walls. I just took one snapshot. You go to Corinth, they're digging these up all the time. Because it tends to be a narcissistic approach, by the way, when people do this. When they're seeking their identity, they want to, instead of taking the challenge of seeing the wholeness of a person, we focus on individualized things. We want to find our 15 minutes of fame. We want to do this. We want to do that. It's about me, myself, and I. That's not what is to be found in the church. Yeah, you have your identity. Yes, we have a decision to follow God or not follow God. But we always follow God on a corporate level in respect of the people. And so the first thing we have to understand are Christians are to respect one another. We're always to respect one another. You might be an ear, you might be an appendix. You might be, I'm telling you, uh, have you ever noticed that take a small part, like a pinky finger. If you forget that it's not part of the whole body, go home, open the drawer up, and if you find a hammer, set it down and bash that pinky, you're going to find out it's part of the body. Real Vestial organs. There was over 200 of those back 50 years ago. They said, you don't need. You don't need the tonsils. You don't need the adenoids. You don't need the appendix. Uh, you can live without this. You know every single one of those now? Every single one. You don't hear that term very much anymore because every single one, they show how physiologically it changed the body. People who had their, I had my tonsils out. Is it any wonder I struggle more with allergies? Uh, people who have their appendix out. They often, to, my grandma, my great-grandmother, who raised my mom, I was doing some genealogy and I found newspaper articles where in 1911 she had an appendicitis. They took it out. Now that was serious. That was before antibiotics. People died with that. But you know, you roll forward to the 1970s when I go over to her house, every single time she'd offer me prune juice. I thought, woman, don't you have like orange juice or something? I want a glass of prune juice? Why? Why are you? I didn't understand that she had done that because she had to adjust her digestive tract. You see, every part matters in the body. And that's important because a lot of times we think that we don't play an important part that we don't play an important part. Well, if we don't do this enough, I'm going to tell you now, remind you now, Christians are to respect each other. It starts out by saying, you are an important part of this body. When we fail to see that everybody needs to respect each other in the body of Christ, they were no longer lined up with God. Because God says everybody plays a part. Sometimes we treat others in the church not as valuable members of the whole body, but like prosthetics that can be taken off and thrown into the closet. We must always have a genuine respect for each other, for each and every part of our fleshly body. We might be very different, but when the covenant of Christ comes, the same spirit that dwells in those who enter that covenant is just as much in the ear, in the foot, 
in the hand, in the eye, even the big toenail, the one that those critters on TV are always digging at and trying to get Lamisil. Yeah, that's a body part too. Look at 19 through 26. <clears throat> if they were all one member, where would the body be? That question right there, when Paul was talking about that That imagine if we were all one part, eyes, a foot, a hand. You know, he says here, but now there are many members, but one body. And I can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, a head to a, the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, very key verse right here, less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas, our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there is no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. For one Member, for if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Using this passage, Paul uses two thoughts to expand the point. The Corinthians were exposed to both Roman and Greek culture. They were in Greece, and Greece was the empire before, but the transition was made to Roman, so they got both. And so Paul will contrast the two in making his argument. First, you have the Roman perspective, recognition of weaker and stronger parts. If you go to Rome during this time, nakedness not as prevalent. You know, they're the toga guys. They'd often show modesty for the more honorable parts by covering them. That's how they do it. What they deemed more honorable and less honorable they determined what they would cover. The Greek perspective, recognition as one, the body as a whole, in the Greek culture, nakedness was quite common. Greeks, they proudly displayed it. You know the Olympic Games? You had to participate nude. Yeah. And they weren't wearing clothes when they were running that track. When they got into a wrestling match, it freaked me out, man. Their statues are more naked. Bathhouses, they just go out and hang around naked. Two views of the body within one head. And so, using both perspectives, perceived uniqueness within one body, this is why Christians must respect one another. They have to respect one another. Christians need each other. It's not only a matter that we have to respect each other, but we need each other. We do. When one falls, the other one helps pick him up. When somebody, if our eyes fail to function, the whole body might walk in danger. Think about what Paul's saying. If you can't see, you could run right into a wall. If the ears don't work and somebody says, stop, there's a car coming, you're going to get hit by the car. If the foot is then broken, then you're going to walk on crutches, requiring the use of our hands. If the hand is damaged, then tying our shoes become very difficult. You're just going to become a couch potato before this thing's over. If you don't 
use all the parts of your body. God never designed us to function independently of each other. We need each other. When one of our members is suffering, we come to their comfort. For when one suffers, the whole body suffers. When one of our members is rejoicing, we can share that joy because the body benefited. When a brother or sister is in need, we become our brother's keeper. If one strays away, we go and get them, as Jude says. When one is weak, the others need to be strong. That's how the body works. You know my mom who's watching? She started having some pain in her good leg during rehabilitation. Because what happens if one leg is weak, you start emphasizing the other. So then she had to treat the foot. And now the foot's feeling better. One part of the body, if you don't think that you need that part of the body, you'll find out real quick when that part of the body fails. It's easy to be macho, man. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kind of tongues. Are all apostles? Are, all are not apostles, are they? No. Are all not prophets, are they? No. Are all teachers? Are, are, are all not teachers, are they? No. All, uh, all are not workers of miracles, are they? No. All do not have the gifts of healing, do they? No. All do not have, uh, do not speak with tongues, do they? No. All do not interpret, do they? No. But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I'll show you still a more excellent way. That leads into the love chapter, which we'll cover next. But this list follows the natural progression of evangelism of the ancient church. Apostles were the first missionaries. They were on the front line, and all these others fell into place as far as the effectivity in the propagation of the gospel of Christ. They assembled other teams to do the same, laying hands on them to empower them with the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus prophesied. By the end of the first century, Nearly the quarter of the entire Roman Empire is estimated to have converted to Christ, which would mean 65 million people would have converted to Christianity. Three quarters of them estimated were slaves. And so, did everyone receive the same gifts? No. Was everyone in the same place? No. Was everything exactly the same for every single person? No, because you had to have people doing different roles. Christians must all work with each other. They have to. They have to. In this time and place, our culture is so divided. It is ridiculous. We can't even show the milk of human kindness to people anymore. But this is the great news. This is the environment that Paul spoke of when we shine as lights among the crooked and perverse generation. When we could stop looking at people for the color of their skin, for their sex, for their educational level, anything. Just say this, that person has a soul, is exactly under the same rules and everything. That is what we have to look at. And even though we're not able to pull off the miracles of the first century, we still have ministerial passions, great talents, and the entire word of God in our hand. If we will just work together as a body of Christ, there's no limit to what our Lord can accomplish. Not what you can accomplish, but what our Lord can accomplish. We can be the body of Christ that he's called us to be, but we all must work together. So in closing, in the strong body of Christ, Christians, we respect each other. We will be held accountable for this, by the way. 
Do we show a genuine respect for each other? Do we think, well, they're not as important of a member of the body of Christ? We really have to ask ourselves that. Christians need each other. Do I view my brother and sister as somebody I need in my life? You know, a young person said to me recently, they said, well, you know, somebody said that you don't really need to go to church to be saved. I would agree with that added with this, why wouldn't they want to be with their church family? That's what will be judged. If somebody was coming to church this morning and a big old branch got blown over and they hit it and popped the tire and they're waiting for AAA to come out, what was their motivation? To be here, to share a life with each other. Christians need each other. Do I view my fellow saint as somebody that I need in my life? Because if, if, if I don't, I have gravely erred, and so have you. Christians work with each other. That's how God designed it for us. 